Okay, welcome to the vlog. If you're new here, my name is Chris and I build productivity apps. I usually focus on one productivity app per video, so today we're focusing on Luna. Quick context, Luna is a budgeting app that I created to help me curb spending. It's also just a project for me to get better as a developer and a designer. So that's the app we're gonna be talking about today. It's been about two months since my last update video on Luna, so it's been a minute. I've been super busy, have not been able to work on this project, but over the weekend, I decided to pick it back up. I randomly decided to check the analytics and see how many people have signed up for the wait list. So there is a wait list. I've been promoting it just through the four YouTube videos on this channel. And surprisingly, actually around like 500 people have signed up for the wait list. On the wait list software that I use, I can see a map of all the people who have signed up. And when I saw this, I was like, wow, there's actually a lot of people who signed up for this. It put it in perspective. And I was like, I should probably try to get this out as soon as possible. So I was a little motivated after seeing that and thought to myself, like, how much do I have left to actually launch? this app. When I listed out all the things that needed to be done to get this ready for beta, I was like, oh, this actually isn't too bad. Maybe I can go ahead and launch it this weekend. So that's what I actually decided to do. I coded like nonstop from Friday night to Sunday night. Over 48 hours, I did everything I possibly could to get this thing ready for beta. So in this video, we're going to walk through what were some of those things that I got done in those 48 hours. I know you guys really like those process behind the scenes videos, so I'll show you guys some of the mistakes, some of the things I learned. We'll also cover a little bit about how I think about beta tests and my process of running a beta test. So yeah, that's what we're going to be covering in the video. Let's talk about like how I typically do a beta test. So I've actually been using the app myself for a few months now. So I've already made a ton of changes based on my actual experience with it. The next step is to open it up to a small number of users. For me, a small number is around like 25 people. So I'm going to open this up to 25 real people who have signed up for the waitlist who actually want to use it and then just go see how they use it, get their feedback, see what bugs we encounter, and then just kind of iterate from there. So once we're done with the 25 users, we'll do the exact same thing, but open it up to 100 users. There's around 500 users users on this waitlist. So I'll probably be able to repeat this process like four times. So hopefully by the end of those rounds, we'll have a way more stable product and a lot of really good feedback to work off of. And this beta period will probably last about a month. I'll probably try to get a new beta out each week. And then hopefully the app's in a really good place by the time we actually launch it on the app store. So that's typically how I structure a beta. I will add analytics like probably midway through the beta. So I can just more accurately track, you know, when are people dropping off in the app? What features are used the most? If I add this feature to the app, will users stick around longer? For this first part, we're just going to keep it simple it'll just be based on what they tell me, like, you know, through word of mouth. No analytics or anything yet, but that will come. So to recap where the app's at since the last video, the app was actually fully functioning. You could log transactions like a normal budgeting app. You can set categories. And something unique about Luna, which I haven't seen in any other budgeting app, is you can have both weekly and monthly categories. When you open the app, you can see both those category types. So if you track groceries and stuff, then that can appear in the monthly section. But if you track dining out, that could be in the weekly section. Fully functioning, you can log transactions, actions. So I was using it for the last few weeks and it was going really, really well. But there were a ton of things that I logged as I was using it, like little minor things that needed to be changed, needed to be addressed before we release this to the public. Here was some of the small stuff that I fixed in these last 48 hours. So for example, I completely forgot to have a sign up screen. Um, I hard coded my user in here, so I didn't need to log in or sign up. Had to go build out that flow. You can actually archive a category. I forgot to build the unarchive button so you can undo that. Creating a category without a name or creating a transaction without a description. I need to handle some of those edge cases and show alerts that say you can't do that. And then like empty states, like showing just a nice thing that's says there's no categories instead of just like a blank screen. A lot of those small things had to be covered. So among all these things, there were three things though that stood out that I wanted to go in depth for this video just because there were some cool things I learned. So the first major thing I did was multi-currency support. To be honest, when I started planning the app out, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do multi-currency support like four or five updates in. Like I wasn't gonna support that initially because it would just simplify things for me if I kept it all in US dollars only. However, after seeing the map of all the users that signed up, most of the people are actually outside the US that wanna use this. I should probably go ahead and add multi-currency support from the beginning. So there are two options when it comes to adding multi-currency support. I can either do a really simple version where I just kind of swap the symbol throughout the app. So if the user selects US dollars, everything will appear in US dollars. But if they select Canadian dollars, everywhere is Canadian dollars. Very simple, not really technically challenging, just a little tedious because I have to go swap it in a bunch of different areas. Second option is to actually do currency conversion. So when someone switches from US dollars to Canadian dollars, I actually do the currency conversion and I swap all the numbers. 100 US dollars is not the same as 100 euros, for example. It's not just as simple as swapping the symbol. I did some research to figure out what other budgeting apps do. Turns out a lot of budgeting apps actually don't even support multi-currency. A lot of them only have support for US.
US currencies. One example is Copilot, which is a really, really nice budgeting app. Maybe I didn't look hard enough, but it looks like they actually don't support anything outside of the US dollar. If I had to guess why that is, they have a lot of banking integrations and something like Plaid, which helps them facilitate and to pull in bank transactions. I think they might actually only support US banks. So that's my guess for why some of these apps only support US dollars. Since I don't have any of these banking integrations, I decided, okay, I'll let me just go do this from the get go. And then the ones that do have multi currency support, only one of them seems to actually do that currency conversion thing. Most of them actually just swap the symbols, they go that simple route. So that's the route that I decided to go added a new setting where users can click it, then a drop down appears that shows all the currencies that are available. I'm gonna start small and just add this list. And then as users request, I'm just gonna keep adding more and more currencies to this. Please comment below what currencies you want supported. I will make sure to go add that before this is released. So once that was added, I stored it in the database and I stored it throughout the app so it can be used. Then I went in and just swapped all places that had US dollars hard coded. Now it's really simple. Once you click it, it actually changes it throughout the app. Some things I ran into though were like, uh, were some formatting issues. So for example, the home screen, when you swap from US dollars to Canadian dollars, it ends up appending CA dollar sign instead of just the dollar sign. Those two extra characters make a big difference, especially on something like the home screen where there's already a lot of text. Formatting is a little bit messed up just because of this change. So I did two changes. I decided to drop the ending cent amount for all of these and just round up. That saved around three characters right there. Um, and Swift actually has this thing. You can add this one line to any text field and it will actually shrink the font size to make sure that it fits the container if it starts going over. It doesn't look good in some cases. So if you have 10,000 Canadian dollars or something, something there, then the, sh the text will look really, really small. But I think for now, this is an okay solution and it's the best solution I can think of right now. So that's what we decided to roll with. Multi-currency support, it actually wasn't too bad. There's a couple little edge cases that I had to think through. So that was the first thing I added, wasn't, wasn't too bad. So the next thing I worked on was animation fixes. So I'm actually pretty new when it comes to things like animations. Like I don't really know much about it. I don't do much of it in my apps. Something I noticed was that when I transitioned from the home screen to the transaction screen, there was this little flash that would be going on. When I slowed down the animation, I noticed, oh, it's that's the empty state. Like when there's no transactions, there's this little illustration. So that empty state appears for a brief second and then starts fading out. And then it gets taken over with the real data as it's coming in. It's a cool effect, but it's very distracting because you know it happens so fast. And what happens is the user just sees it as a blip. It's just, it's just super busy and it's not as clean as just transitioning to that page. Made a quick change and I preload the data before we get to that page. And you can see now the transition is just a super clean transition. Transitions to the next page and that data is already loaded. And same thing with the home screen. I realized data actually reloaded when I went back to the page. And when that happens, you get this interesting effect where the weekly and the monthly bars right here, they start changing positions because data starts getting filled in. Again, it's a really cool effect, but it is very distracting every time you switch between pages and all those transitions are happening. So same concept here. I decided to preload the data before the page gets hit. Now the transition is a lot smoother. Another place which is interesting that I just wanted to show was when you're logging a transaction, I have this custom screen that I built. For some reason, it just felt like super jittery and choppy. So I had to really tweak the animation over and over again to get it to the point where it felt a little bit more natural and less jittery and something like once you click the period button, it starts shifting over things and then the period zero zero just start appearing on the right side. Little things like that had to be thought through. I just wanted to show you guys what that kind of transition work actually looks like. And so I just did a lot of this cleanup to make that I feel a lot more smooth. So that was the transition in the animation stuff that I had to do. So the last major thing that I worked on was I really wanted to make a lock screen widget. I had this idea where I wanted it to just show something like this is how much you spend and this is how many days are left in the week. And so just at a glance, I can see, oh wow, I've spent like, you know, $2,000 this week, what's going on? I'd just be able to see that on my lock screen, which I thought would be pretty cool. And then I also wanted it where when you click it, one click and instantly start logging the transactions. Um, I thought this wouldn't be too hard. One complicated thing though, is your app and your widget can't just talk to each other. So I, I don't have access to all the data that the app has. My plan was to use this thing called SQLite, which I had heard a lot about. I won't try to explain what SQLite is, but you can think of it as this database that lives on the user's device. My plan was to download data from the main app into the SQLite database on the phone. And then the app could also read the same database and in effect, basically have access to all the data that the app has. That was the original plan. So I learned a ton about SQLite. It was really interesting, spent a few hours on that. And the end result was, I was actually able to get the widget to pull data from SQLite. This was the end result, which was kind of cool. One tricky thing I noticed though, in the documentation for the SQLite library that I was using for Swift was, it specifically says not to use it in the way that I'm using it because I guess there's just some issues with that and some edge cases. When I read that, I was like, 
ah, oh, okay. Like I could continue doing this, but I'll probably run into issues down the line. I should probably, you know, scrap this and go a different route. I swapped everything from SQLite to this thing called Core Data. And Core Data, it's like Apple's native solution for storing data on device. I think it's actually built on top of SQLite, to be honest, but basically it's something Apple made to let apps and widgets store data directly on the device. I really didn't want to learn it because like I tried it years ago and it was such a bad experience that I was like, oh, if I could avoid this, I'd love to. Decided to bite the bullet, learn it. Actually wasn't as bad as I thought, which means I'm probably a better programmer than I was a few years ago. Migrating everything from the SQLite to the core data was actually not too bad. And I got the deep link to work and it was super easy, just like six lines of code where now when you click it, it'll open the app and immediately open up the new transaction dialogue. Total, we're talking like 160 lines of code to build this widget. And it comes in two variations. There's a rectangular view and a smaller circular view. Yeah, those are both there. We'll definitely be building a proper home screen widget too. Honestly, I was really surprised I was able to ship that in these 48 hours. Yeah, multi-currency support, this animation stuff, and then the widget. These were like probably the three biggest things that I had to do in the 48 hours. But this in combination with all the small stuff, and I think the app's actually in a really good state to do this first round of beta. So I uploaded the build to Apple last night, and hopefully Apple will approve that. You actually do have to go through a small review process with Apple even for beta apps. So there's a review process for the App Store, which is really strict. And then there's a review process for beta test flight apps. And it's not as strict, but they can still reject you for a number of different reasons. We'll see if they approve it. And if they do, we'll probably be starting the private beta today. Uh, next couple steps I have with this are I'm going to be installing analytics probably in the next few weeks so I can start tracking things of how the beta is going. Got to make screenshots. Got to actually make a real onboarding process for this because right now you sign up and you're just thrown into the app. Welcome email. So there's just like a ton of stuff I have to do, but we'll cover that in the next video. Probably a similar video to this where it's like the process of launching it on the app store. If you're watching this and the app's still in beta, you can join the waitlist by clicking the link in the description. Or if the app's released by now, you can just download it from the app store. But yeah, hopefully this video was interesting for you guys. If you like this kind of content, definitely go check out my TikTok and Instagram. I post almost every other day about building productivity apps. And obviously, if you like this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.